Um, we're very honoured uh, that George has agreed to come and host our annual Peace Lecture this year. Um, he's on a tour of um, the UK um, and has managed to uh, fit us in, which is, um, as I say, a great honour. So, George Lakey, um, a long-term activist and um, Quaker. This is the second event in this Britain tour, this uh, UK tour. Last night it was Nottingham, if I remember right. <laughs> and here I am tonight, and I'm so glad to see you freshly, because you probably won't be interested in me after two weeks, I'll be really tired. But I'm very, very happy to be here and to talk about polarization, because that is such an, a brim hot topic in my country, the United States, and I'm told it's also a hot topic here as well. So I'd like us to start out just comparing notes about what polarization means to you, what the division is that strikes you as significant, and especially the two things that I'm particularly interested in you addressing is what are some indications that you find in society of division and polarization? What, 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 uh, what are the things that you have noticed specifically, not just told to you by media commentators, but things that you have personally noticed? And second, uh, what your feelings are about it. Your feelings might be all over the place. Some of you might be elated. At last, we're in struggle. And others of you might be thinking, oh, this is just terrible because it's so ugly. I don't know what your feelings might be. So. I'd like you to compare notes with each other, both of those things. What do you observe about the division? And also what your feelings are about that. And I'd like you to share with people that you don't already know. So probably most of you are uh, here with somebody that you know. So that might require getting up and turning around and finding somebody you don't know. And this is also, of course, the hidden agenda here is for Quakers to get to know more non-Quakers. So please, on your feet, find somebody else to talk with about what do you observe about division here, about polarization, and what are your feelings about it? Thank you. I'd like to invite you to turn your attention back to the front. How many of you were able to get to someone that you didn't already know? Oh, that's a good number. That's tremendous. That's, that's really great. And how many of you were able to, uh, to share an observation that you have of what, what, the dif what difference is, what polarization is about here, what division is in your experience? And, and how many of you ha were in touch with some feeling state or other about it and able to share that? We're, some of you, but not, not so many as the earlier. Okay, so maybe feelings come later, and maybe they don't. We'll just see what happens. Uh, I, one reason I've been caring a lot about polarization has been because it's been going on in my society, and a lot of the people that I hang out with have not been pleased, because a lot of the expressions of polarization in the United States have not been nice, <laughs> have been ugly, and in fact, uh, we've had some killings around polarization. And so, um, so people, uh, I, I find a fair number of people reacting to that in uh, particular ways that I think are in some, some respects, well, in all respects, are totally human and natural, and on the other hand, can get in the way of getting out of this period. So I, I became really fascinated with this question, how do societies handle polarization and division? Well, of course I'm immersed, you can tell this is a Norwegian sweater, I'm immersed in <laughs> my study of the Nordic countries, which started actually long ago. It started by falling in love with a Norwegian. And uh, one way to get to know another country is to fall in love with somebody from it, right? So that, that motivated me a whole lot. In fact, I even had to follow her to Norway to marry her. And then once having done that, I found myself incentivized to learn the language because for one thing, I wanted to know what was it the priest actually said that I agreed to 
<laughs> and also, I found that her family did not speak English, and so I needed to learn Norwegian to be able to get along with them, and so on. And it started a whole, uh, a whole, practically a lifetime, because I was a child groom. I was a mere stripling when I married. So I've had a lot of years to try to understand the Nordics. And, uh, and, and then when the opportunity came to, to uh, write a book, I was a professor at a college that wanted to support me to do that. I thought, well, this is a great chance to dig not only into what, what they have now, and you probably know that the Nordic countries are, are playing musical chairs at the top tier of various indicators of of uh, well-being, uh, economic well-being. Uh, they take turns being the world's happiest people, right? I think this year it's Norway's turn, but last year it was Denmark's turn, and a few years ago it was Iceland's turn, and it's a kind of, oh, you know, your turn, like that. That goes on about being happy. Um, and so, so they, they've solved a lot of their problems. They have still other problems that they are facing and they're working on. So they're not utopian, but they, they handled so many things that in my country anyway are still very pro problematic that I was curious, well, how did they go about it? Maybe we could learn some tips. For example, my country still has enormous poverty. It's a country of enormous wealth and enormous poverty and uh, the, the people are, are hungry. Even, even uh, university students are hungry. We have a hunger problem among our undergraduates in universities. Um, so, and economic inequality, of course, has gone, you know, it's practically off the charts. So we, we have problems like that, which they pretty much took care of. They decided poverty wasn't a great idea. Um, they, they thought poverty, frankly, they thought poverty was very 19th century. Like, wh why, why would an advanced economy have poverty? You know? Their attitude was, if you're really interested in poverty, read Charles Dickens. <laughs> Easily available. You don't have to have poverty in order to learn about poverty. Read Charles Dickens or read uh, sociological tracts. You don't need to have it around anymore. There's no excuse, really. Uh, so they, de they de uh, and so I wrote a chapter on how they got rid of poverty. So all, all of that went into the book, but uh, what I was especially interested in, because there are other, others who've written about what's going on over there, is how they got there. Because they, they went through a tremendous kind of convulsion in order to get there. And that is not well known. In fact, I've, I've found Norwegians reluctant to even talk about it. And I would have to press them. Well, but what really went on in the 20s for you? What really went on in the 30s? And then they'd want to jump ahead. Hmm, what's going on here? And uh, because 100 years ago, they were a mess. They, they had enormous poverty. They had uh, huge income inequality. Uh, they, it was, uh, there, there were parts of their society that were so wretched, they were getting out. They were going to Canada, they were going to the US, they were going to Australia, they were getting out, right? And, and then they turned themselves around. So how did they do that? Well, what then struck me about polarization was that they made their breakthrough at the time in their history when they were the most polarized. Well, as an American, that struck me as really uh, really extraordinary, really quite remarkable, because so many people I'm in touch with think of the polarization we're going through as a stuck time, a time when you would just as soon pull up the covers and hope that when you wake up it's over, rather than seeing it as, oh, this is a time when, when things are in motion. These are, these, this, this is a time when we can get something done. But the Nordics took the second attitude, they thought, oh, this, this is when we get our opportunity. Uh, and I don't think they got it from the Chinese. I'm told that there are these Chinese characters that mean crisis means uh, opportunity, that that kind of concept goes together. But I, I doubt that the Nordics 100 years ago were students of Chinese. I think they just really understood Maybe they understood it from blacksmiths. You know about the process of one, in wanting to turn hard iron into a horseshoe. 
you just can't do that with ordinary tools unless you make that iron malleable, right? You've, you've got to put it in the fire. <laughs> you heat it up. And when you've heated up the metal, then it becomes able to be shaped and formed into what you want. And maybe one metaphor that we could use for polarization is it's a time to go into the blacksmith's fire. It's a time to get heated up. Things get in motion, and that makes new things possible that were not possible before. So these were metaphors that started to come to me when I was studying what went on for them. I also wanted to know why didn't they go the way of Germany, similarly polarized, right, in the 20s and 30s, and Italy, similarly polarized. Uh, the, the polars, I mean, I, I, I should describe it maybe a little bit more. In the streets of Norway, you could see Nazis marching, right, swastikas and all. And, and at the same time in that society, there were communists organizing for the dictatorship of the proletariat. When you say that's a pretty wide spectrum. Of course, you also had it here, right? You had your Mobley, uh, your, your, your uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name, Mobley, right? Yeah, yeah, Os Oswald Mobley, right, right? And a fascist movement, right? With brown shirts, black shirts, brown, yeah, black shirts. Okay, so you had that phenomenon going on roughly at the same time, right? And a, trem and a tremendous lot in motion. Uh, and so, I was curious, well, if they had that degree of polarization, then what enabled them to move through that to a really changed and far more just society while the Italians and Germans went instead into full-scale fascism, or in the German case, the Nazi version of that. And so that's, that's what I'd like to share. And I, I'll just share it briefly so that you can consider it a little bit more in your buzzes and then ask questions and see if we can get even into more of a, a kind of strategy that we'll develop and then we'll publish it, right? And we'll say it all happened right here in this town. Um, yeah, so one of the things I noticed was they got very fascinated with what they wanted instead of what they didn't want. Now, in my country, activists are kind of specialists in protest. We don't want that. We don't want that. We don't want that. You know, and the longer you're an activist, the longer your list. <laughs> and you, you can go to a different meeting every night in a, in a large town, you know, and, and protest this and protest. And now we'll need to protest that and protest that. And uh, that makes an activist's life for some people. But they were way more interested in what is it we want rather than what do we not want. And that gave a different kind of appeal. You could picture that, right? People who are not activists, not self-identified activists, people watching the baby movement growing and growing would be saying, oh, is that what they want? Well, I want that too. I don't like living in a society with poverty and high crime rate and that kind of thing. I, I want that. I, maybe I should join. So that was one of the important things that they did. They created a vision. Now, it was a vision based on uh, some economic theory from economists. It was also from the common sense of the people. And they were very interested in describing that vision as much in common sense terms as possible. So it wasn't a utopian vision in the sense that uh, I, I think of utopia as, uh, as springing from the imagination, like an art form. And I, I love that kind of thinking myself, and I've done some of that, some writing about that. But this wasn't so much, um, let's exercise our imaginations to make a kind of perfect society. It was much more, wh what, are, you know, what are the basic needs that we've got as a people that we could realize if we created a different kind of economic model that didn't start by reverencing capital, but instead started by reverencing the experience of ordinary people. What if we were to do that? You know, a kind of worker-centered economy rather than a capital-centered economy. What are all the things that could flow from that? And since they were speaking to the majority, they weren't really worried about what the economic elite thought about their, their uh, vision 
because they didn't expect the economic elite to like it anyway. <laughs> so they really weren't worried about how can we tailor this so as to gain the acceptance of the people who are running the society. They just figured, well, they're running the society, they're dominating it, they're really, it's only a pretend democracy anyway. So of course they will defend their privilege. They're not gonna like this. So let's create a, a picture of of economics and social justice that can appeal to a majority of us and then we'll assert that we want that and then we'll get that by the way we assert it. We'll struggle for it, we'll fight for it, and we'll win and we'll push the economic elite out of the way. That's what they thought would be cool to do. Uh, I, I don't suppose they were asking the economic elite, you know, how do you feel about this? It was just, this is what we want, but they were mobilizing behind a positive vision. So. I, I've been sharing that with Americans and more and more uh, as I travel around the states, people have been saying, well, that would in some ways be a relief because it can be, if, if, you, if you're anxious personally about division and polarization, right? And then you add to it all the negativity that's involved in protest, you know, like really getting to know the subject, climate crisis is gonna get us. <laughs> for the following reasons. I spoke to, a, a very recently, just a few weeks ago, to a statewide convention of uh, environmentalists in, in, in Maine. And, um, and I, I had enough time with them, so I was asking them, so what do you do in your local chapters? Like, when you meet and so on, what do you do? Oh, we watch films about uh, about uh, you know the disintegration of the soil and we what the sun's going to do and what this is going to do and the, the scarcity of water that we're going to experience and so on and I said wow that must be really wonderful me <laughs> inspire <laughs> inspiring meetings they said you know we do have some trouble getting people out <laughs> gloom and doom and there's always more detail to be learned about gloom and doom thank you know the scientists are turning it out, right? So we can always learn more about uh, how quickly it'll be too late to do anything about it. <laughs> so that's just one area. We, uh, imperialism, we can spend a lot of time learning the details of all the ways that the global south gets hurt by you know my nation and yours and so on. Uh, uh, there's always more detail to learn, but how does that help us change anything? It depresses us, but it doesn't help us to change anything. Well. What the Nordics did was instead, they did learn a lot about how to change things. So I was saying to the folks in Maine, how about you show movies about social movements and successful social movements that show how they succeeded and make that the content of what you're learning. You don't need to convince yourselves that climate's a problem or that inequality is a problem. You, you already are in the meeting because you agree with that, right? So you don't need more details to back you up on that. What maybe would be more useful would be to learn how do successful social movements work so we can be a successful social movement and deal with whatever it is that we're dealing with. So they were striking, they, they, they thought that made some sense. Uh, so I'm trying it out here in the UK, see if you think that makes some sense. But anyway, uh, that, that whole positivity thing can, uh, can, really, can really help a lot. So that's one thing. And then an, another thing to consider is um, not to get distracted by our opponents. I had a wonderful talk this morning with a man in uh, Nottingham. Some of you may know Ross um, Bradford, uh, who was in a bookshop which in the early 90s was just about totally wrecked by... <laughs> I see at least one knowing smile here, um, by anti-fascists uh, because, am I right? Yes, because uh, this bookshop was a left bookshop and, the, uh, and, and they, let me, let me try to get this straight, they, uh, no, no, it was, it was, no, it was, practically wrecked by fascists, that's right, by, by right-wingers, by uh, getting, getting uh, the players wrong. Don't get me started about football because I'd be even worse. Um, yeah, that, that's right, and, and, and so he got terribly beaten up and, the, and the, uh, the, the, he said the photograph was all over the place of what the, the bookshop looked like after that. Um, 
and and so he he decided that since there was a rising tide he felt in in Britain of uh, racism in the early 90s some of you are nodding your heads it looks like you're remembering that period um, that it was really important to stand up against racism and to make and, and therefore to go after the people who were uh, proponents of racism and try to push them out of the political dialogue, like really shut them up. Like that was, that was the goal. And that reminded me of, uh, of in my country when there, there were people getting very upset about the Ku Klux Klan and saying, well, we, we, yes, and we have to go after them and we have to shut them up and, you know, put them away so that they're out of sight and they, they can't grow. And there's something very human about that, that reaction, right? If, if, it's, if it's horrible and it's oppressive and it hurts people, uh, then we have, we have to focus on getting rid of it. But the Nordics did not make that focus. Instead, they kept their eye on in the civil rights movement, that was where I was first arrested. So that, that was a big formative movement for me in the States. Um, they, they kept, the song goes, keep your eye on the prize, hold on. Keep your eye on what it is you want instead of having your emotional and intellectual tension be put on what it is you don't want. We know that in Germany, it got to the point where there was routine street fighting, right, between the left and the right. And people would go after the, ta the taverns where the other side liked to drink at night and then have big street fights outside, right? And the idea of the anti-fascists was we're going to suppress the Nazis by fighting it out. And it, instead, what they did was laid the groundwork through more and more chaos in that society um, so that people in the middle started to clamor for order. They didn't like all that chaos and violence going on. And Hitler got the nod partly because he was promising order. Same in Italy with Mussolini. Because at some point, people get so upset about disorder that they think, well, that's, that's number one. You know, that just the basic sense of security is number one. Yes, there's a lot else that's wrong, but at least we shouldn't, we shouldn't be having all this chaos. Well, what my conversation with Ross uh, taught me this morning was that there was a big reservoir of you people who felt very strongly that nobody should be smashing bookstores. <laughs> And the, he said that the turnout at Market Square in Nottingham was the largest demonstration that there had been since the 1930s in that city. It was just an upwelling of people saying, no, we, we, we defend books, <laughs> we defend political dialogue, we defend free speech, that, that's what it is to be British. Okay, now imagine taking that the next step. The next step would be to ask ourselves, why is, are there times when the extreme right becomes a big deal and other times when it's not a big deal? I mean, it's always there. It's kind of in the, you know, way, way in the corner, but it's not like it becomes prominent all the time. It becomes prominent when there's increased poverty, right? when there's increased unemployment, when the, the inequality scale goes off the charts, that's when the problem emerges. Which, and, and who is it that is directing the economy when the economy goes that way, when it gets so distorted? It's not those folks who've signed up to be, anti, uh, to be, uh, to be white supremacists. It's not those folks who are creating this problem. It's the economically, it's the people at the top of the economy who are actually calling the shots about the shape and direction of the economy, right? So what the Nordics thought was, well, we will pay attention to change and pushing out of power 
the people who are actually taking charge of the whole economy so that we can take, care of, to take charge of the economy and create justice. That's what we can do. And the, the Nazis will take care of themselves. And that worked. So rather than be baited into street fighting, rather than be baited into growing chaos in Norway, growing chaos in Sweden, they said, no, 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 we're going to keep our eye on the prize. We have movements that understand what it is that we want, and we're going to keep that positive direction and not be distracted by this thing that then we get so reactive to that we've lost sight of what it is that we need to appeal to in the broader public so that our relatively small movement can grow and grow and grow and become the movement that is its potential. It worked. They became majority movements and they were able to push out of power the economic elite and then they could create economic justice, and so the, uh, the far right and the racist uh, element uh, went away, that is to say subsided, sort of beneath the floorboards or something like that, <laughs> so it wasn't so obvious anymore. So I thought, well, that's, that's a really interesting story for us to understand. It's in a way counterintuitive, right? I mean, when you see something so, so dramatic, that's where your attention goes. Right? And you can forget about, wait a minute, what is it what I want? Well, believe it or not, I mean, it, it, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I guess it was, I was sitting in Oslo with the Anti Racism Center of uh, this government supported, they have anti racist uh, work workers going on that are funded by the government. And I was sitting with the staff there asking, so how are things going now in Norway? And they had just come back from Sweden. So how are things going in Norway and Sweden? Because we hear in the media that racism is becoming more of a problem in your countries because of immigration and that there's more, you know, more intolerance and so on. So I'm just doing this check-in because I wrote about you folks and the, and the problem. I, I have a whole chapter on racism in the Nordic countries in my book, so now I need to check in and find out what's going on. And they said, it's a double phenomenon. It's very, very hard to characterize. If you look at on the ground about what's really going on in terms of interaction, in terms of opportunity for jobs, opportunity for mobility, and so on, uh, integration here is going well. That there's more and more opportunity for people of color, more and more opportunity for, uh, for immigrants to make their way uh, forward in Norwegian society, and that's true in Sweden as well. And uh, there's a solid majority in both countries in favor of immigration. However, that's not what, get the head, what gets the headlines. Because the pushback is growing in its drama, ironically, because of the success of the integration process because of the success of, of immigration into those countries. In other words, from the point of view of the racists, they're losing, <laughs> right? And what do people do when they lose? They make more noise. They make more drama, right? So this year there was a Nazi march, an actual Nazi march in Norway, in Kristiansand, and also there was one in uh, Sweden very well covered. So the media in those countries are full of discussion of racism and so on and so on. Uh, two of the three people that I talked with are people of color. Um, the, the woman of those two, uh, who is a Muslim woman, said she has this weird um, double experience going on inside her because on social media and in, in the uh, publicity and so on, uh, she's aware of the increasingly hateful and, and uh, you know, disgusting and, and uh, absurd allegations from the, from the races. And so it makes her uh, heart beat faster. She feels fear. She feels insecure because she's aware of that, right? And at the same time, she knows what the other people in the, in the movement know, which is they're actually making progress, steady progress. 
So she goes around with this double consciousness. On the one hand, I'm more scared now than I was five years ago. And on the other hand, I know that that fear is unfounded. It's just my reaction, my emotional reaction to all the drama that they're creating. I thought, well, that's, isn't that human? So it turns out that this, this business about how it is we can um, move our societies forward in, when they're divided uh, is is a, is more complicated than it may f first appear. It definitely doesn't seem to help to just pull up the covers and go <laughs> and hope that somebody will wake us up when it's over. Um, it seems like we need to do something. It seems like if we just focus on protesting the things we don't like, that that isn't nearly as useful as it is to go for what we do want and then to create movements that are so powerful that they can actually address the problems that otherwise get capitalized upon by the races and, and uh, those who would divide us from making, from making sense that, you know, making sense, sense out of policies that need to be advanced. So that's what I'm so curious to get your response to because it does have to do with the, um, the management of, of ourselves on a feeling level. Now, on the one hand, I think, oh, that's not so hard because people's movements have done that for a long time. I mean, that was my initiation in the civil rights movement where we were going uh, you know, up against the Ku Klux Klan, we were going up against the Nazi party, we had a resurrection of the American Nazi party in the 60s. Um, we had a lot of that kind of right wing uh, background. Uh, I was beaten up several times. A lot of civil rights movement uh, people were beaten up way more, you know, more severely than I was. We had deaths, we had killings and so on. So th that is a kind of emotional management kind of question, you know, like how do we keep our courage in a situation where we know that there is the, the pushback that, that uh, is expressed as threat. So that's one of the things that I'd like you to talk about in a minute. And then the other thing is um, whether you think there's some potential in um, digging in more to what, how the Nordics actually went ahead and made it an opportunity for themselves to change their societies in a decisive way by making a power shift and whether, whether that, that tempts you. So let's try that. Go back to those people you were talking with earlier and check in with them. What are they thinking about the feeling side of this? And what are they thinking about the strategy side of this? Please. I love this part. When you're so eager to make the point, you just keep going, right? And defiance of authority is wonderful too. So that's, you know, you get that extra, that extra little touch of dessert by defying me. That's really great. My children know that too. So what are your questions? I, I imagine you've got so many questions and comments and also uh, challenges to things that I've said because I've tried to be at least a little bit provocative. So maybe you have some challenges as well. What do you have? Please put up your hand. Yes, great, thank you. How about if I respond to one of your many fascinating issues, and the one that I'd like to respond to is the post-World War II change that happened here, which was remarkable, and, and I, I think probably most people would be grateful that it happened, um, and, and your reminder of us that the 30s and the 20s here was also a very big time of turbulence, right? Uh, so, yeah, the po and and so it it is a reasonable question. Uh, why uh, why didn't you post 1945 uh, continue to evolve your system so that you're right up there at the top tier with Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and and Iceland, right? Um, and w the difference is that what. Uh, what they did was they pushed in the 30s so hard that they actually pushed their economic elite out of dominance. That is, that they made an actual power shift, whereas that didn't, as I understand it, happen here. That is, the dominance of, the, of the, what we in the U.S. call the 1%, I guess your Occupy people call the 1%, right? Uh, the dominance of the 1% has continued. And it made, the, the elite made a big accommodation to you after World War II, 
for a lot of reasons, including probably the growth of the Communist Party during World War II, and thought, well, we need to you know, make an accommodation to this growing um, uh, upset that's going on among our people, but that doesn't mean that they gave up the driver's seat. And that's the difference. And in, in the Nordic countries, um, Norway and Sweden, in the, well, 31 for Sweden, 36, 35 in uh, Norway, actually earlier than that in Denmark, there was an actual power shift such that the majority stepped in and took control of the direction of the economy. And the economic elite uh, then became uh, not politically dominant anymore. They, they still had their party. But for example, when the Swedish Social Democrats took over, they just ran the place for 35, 40 years, something like that. And uh, the same in Denmark and, and same in Norway. So they, they weren't rubbed out. They, you know, the, these were folks who lived close to Russia and they knew the armed struggle approach, right? They no, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna push out their power nonviolently, but we're going to push it out. So it was that decisive shift that didn't happen here. We also in the US had a very turbulent 30s and we got some very big gains out of it. But on the other hand, um, we, didn't, we didn't kind of go up over the top. If you picked a, if pictured a movement like struggle, 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 struggle up the hill and then over the top, whoa. And uh, we didn't get over the top and I think you didn't get there either. So that, that explains that part. Yes. I'm from Turkey. From Turkey, yes, thank you. My guess is that you cannot, as an individual, stand up to that. That is, I think human beings are made to be such social beings that we actually need each other to be able to stand up to anything that's really well-oiled, as you say, and really organized. Uh, even to maintain our, an attitude of positivity and, and, and empowerment, we need others to support us to do that. So I would suggest, first thing, is to find a group find a group to work with. Um, I, I need that as much as anyone I know. So seven years ago, I realized, uh-oh, I don't have a group right now. So I helped to start a group. We call ourselves the Earth Quaker Action Team. <laughs> we wanna make earthquakes, right? And we're Quakers. <laughs> <laughs> and action is our middle name. And we're team, right? Because Americans are probably even more individualistic than you are. And there's a tendency to go into ourselves expecting too much from an individual when actually we need a team to get things done, right? So one of the things we did, we decided, okay, we're going to go after, uh, we're, we're going to bypass the middleman. There's a, a big um, fetish in the U.S. about always going to politicians for something, 
oh, we want to change, so let's get a politician to change, or let's get parliament to do this, or the government to do that, right? We thought, well, since the economic elite, at least in the U.S., runs the government, it, it makes the basic decisions, let's go, let's forget about the middleman and just go directly to the source. So we thought, okay, let's go after a bank <laughs> that is financing mountaintop removal coal mining. In the United States, you're not going to believe this, but in the United States, we, we've had a habit of blowing up mountains in order to get coal. It's, it's cheaper because you don't have to pay a lot of people to tunnel into the area. You just like blow off the top and then huge machines take the coal and then blow off another and then like that. So we've, we've uh, destroyed 500 mountains so far. Um, I think the practice is done partly because of our group because we went after the number one financer of that an important income stream for that bank and we decided to uh, go after them so we sat down with the president of the region uh, regional um, bank and said we Quakers are coming after you watch out he was not impressed in fact I don't really know anybody who's scared of Quakers but they found out that we were worthy opponents, to use Gandhi's phrase, because we kept after them and kept after them. At the beginning, we were small. We started in a living room. We were a small group. Um, Gandhi once said, if you're ever worried that your group is too small to make a difference, try spending the night in a tent with a mosquito. <laughs> so, <laughs> in the beginning, we were a mosquito, biting, 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 uh, and we were we were uh, you know reaching for the Quaker legacy for inspiration for how to bite. For example, a typical action was to go into a bank branch. A nice thing about attacking a bank, by the way, if you've ever wanted to attack a bank, is that they have branches in a lot of places, right? So we would go into a bank, single file, we'd circle up in the middle of the bank branch, and we would sit down in a circle, and we would start worshiping. And out of the worship would come testimony about mountains and nature and, and the people in, uh, next to those mountains who are, have twice the cancer rates that they used to have and more birth defects and so we would talk about that and we would sing. You know, it is hard to do a bank's business <laughs> when you have that going on, right? So it drove them crazy. The, the, the bank managers would, you know, get security Get those people out of here. Security would say, get out of here. We'd say, no, we're busy worshiping. You know, so then they would call the police and the police would come. And sometimes uh, we would get up and go because we didn't have anybody ready to be arrested that day. And other times we would, uh, we would just stay and then we would be arrested and off to jail. And we, so we would do that over and over and over and over. I was arrested a number of times doing that. It was just tremendous fun to, to <laughs> 10 people, 15 people. It's a small group that can really totally disrupt the uh, operations of a bank, a bank branch. Um, so we were doing it in more and more places and we would have simultaneous days, you know, and see if we could do 15 of those all in the same day in different banks. And then, oh good, we did 15, now let's go for 30. And so on. Uh, we we did a long march to the capital uh, to to the headquarters uh, across Pennsylvania, 200 miles. I was I guess 76 years old at that time. I thought I can't walk 200 miles. I walked 200 miles because as an individual I couldn't, but as a member of a group I could. And we inspired each other. We walked the 200 miles, and then of course we got arrested all over the place in the cap in in the headquarters city. We also went to shareholders meetings. That by the way, if you're interested as I am in how uh, the economic elite works, why not just get in there with them? So we went into the shareholders meetings. We each bought a share. So we were an owner of the bank too, right? So we went in there and um, th we noticed all these police in the back. Wonder why? <laughs> the bank, of course, had been surveilling us for years. They knew what we were going to do. So, uh, so we, we would sit in among the different uh, you know, regular shareholders so that when the police had to arrest us, they'd be like pawing over the regular shareholders to get us and take us out. And, uh, 
And we had 16 people who were able to get shares in time to get in. One of them was a professor of logic at, uh, at Princeton University who'd retired. She was, a, she was herself one of the 1%, very wealthy uh, Quaker woman. Um, who, who, and this was going to be her first arrest. And she thought, well, I have to look really good for my first arrest. So she, I, I wish I had a photograph of beautifully turned out, this gorgeous uh, uh, ensemble with her best pearls. And uh, she was all set. So we were all sitting you know, all over the place. And, uh, and we were, though, nervous. I admit this, because a lot of uh, Quakers are brought up middle class and therefore with some inclination to follow rules. I don't know how many of you were brought up middle class, but I see heads nodding. You know, the middle class parents usually want their children to know how to follow rules, right? So we were, we had been to shareholders meetings before and had followed rules and uh, waited until the question and answer and then gotten up and made our statement. But this was going to be to disrupt and shut down the meeting, right? That is not following the rules. So we were, as we got close to the event, we started getting nervous. Okay, here's where feelings come in again. So we had a coach. I, by the way, advise uh, action groups or any group that wants to get really good to have a coach. Somebody who stands aside from the group but is available to give advice. It can really help you get on your you know, get, get on your best performance. So we went to Daniel, this, uh, our coach, and said, we're awfully nervous and we're wondering if you have any advice. He said, look at it this way. What are Quakers good at? Quakers are good at meetings. <laughs> so, just go into their meeting and have a meeting. So have an agenda, know who's going to speak to each, each issue and so on, and just go ahead and have your meeting. You just happen to be in the same space at the same time <laughs> as this mighty bank is having its meeting. No problem. Oh, we thought, oh, we could do that. We're awesome at having meetings. So that's what we did. So we had, you know, so the, so the CEO who was on the stage, and now the, you know, the secretary's report, so the secretary would get up and start reading the report. And what, but that would be time for our agenda, you know, so we'd jump up and blah, blah, you know, like that. And then uh, the CEO would be tempted to call the police and, and then he'd say, oh, but it looks like it's just about done. So <sighs> yeah. and the treasury's report, town treasury's report, treasury get up. And that would, somebody else would be moved to, you know, talk about Appalachia very loudly and, and so on. And we just had this meeting and guess which meeting won? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> After 20 minutes of an hour-long expected meeting, the CEO threw up his hands. I had never seen anybody throw up their hands before. I thought that was just a novelistic <laughs> expression. He literally threw up both hands and said, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> We were all stunned. We didn't expect it to turn out this way so easily. And uh, my daughter, who is across the auditorium sitting over there, uh, she starts singing, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. And that's our theme song. And so uh, uh, people were getting up, heading for the exits, and all of us were singing, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it And I look around and I see some of the regular shareholders were singing, This little light of mine. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> so that that's just a, the flavor of our group. It's a group that builds on positivity, right? Very, very supportive to each other. There's no ought or should about going to jail or anything like that. You know, it's just like what you're ready to do, but we're here to support you. We attract young people like crazy. Uh, we have more 20-somethings than any other age group. We do have teens and 30s and 40s and 50s and 80s, but we, uh, but we especially have 20s. They run the board of, of our group. Um, and we've grown, we grew to, what did we grow to? 13 states by the time the bank said, this is impossible. We give up, we're getting, giving up, getting out of the business 
because we just can't stand it. The, the, this, as far as we can tell, Earthquaker Action Team just keeps growing and growing and growing and being more and more annoying, and there's no stopping them, and they are so persistent they'll be doing this forever. Well, we'd been doing, we did 125 actions in our five years, and they said, we're done. We're, we're finished, and they proclaimed. And not very long after they got out of the business, Barclays Bank got out of the business, and J.P. Morgan got out of the business, and uh, I don't think a mountain has been blown up uh, since, since our campaign. So that would be an example. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, each, I mean, you'll notice there's a cultural aspect to this, right? We were drawing on the inspiration that the, the particular legacy of our being Quakers, Baptists might do it some differently or some, some other group, young people might do it uh, who are humanists or something might be doing it in a different way. But the thing is that we were always looking for ways of communicating a positive vision, which is the people of Appalachia healthy and well and economic and being treated justly. Uh, and at the same time, engaging and disruptive activity such that the one percent well oiled you know plenty of power i mean they in worldly terms they had the power right but it turned out that we forced them out of doing that now if you multiply that and we never did get to be a really large group now if you multiply that by the enormous numbers of people who are very unhappy with the degree of injustice that exists in the U.S. or in Britain or you know in many places, then 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 you get the flavor of the kind of movement that can push the economic elite out and set up the, the a system that works for us, and that's that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for movements that are so both positive and nonviolently disruptive that they just can't be stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and the secret is to keep our eye on the prize, as the civil rights movement used to sing it. Another question or challenge, yes. You, you mentioned the comparison between the Nordic countries and this country after the war. Mm. And you pointed out, or you suggested, that one of the big differences was that in the Nordic countries, um, society got rid of what we call the 1%, mm. and in the UK, we didn't. Mm -hmm. Great question. <laughs> the second one, if, you, if it did happen that you got rid of the 1%, how did you do that? Or how did they do that? How did they do that? Okay. So were you able to hear the question, did they really get rid of, and how did they do it? They didn't really get rid of in the sense of, uh, you know, put it in the closet and lock it up. Uh, so they were still politically active. The Conservative Party of, uh, of Norway represents them uh, pretty well and, and so on. So th they were allowed to remain politically active. It's just that before that, they, what they said went. But instead, the majority of people got, uh, so d d d decisions about the direction of the economy were made by the majority of people represented in parliament by the parties that represent them. And the conservatives were always uh, outvoted and, had, and didn't have the means of retaining their, their dominance because it had been fought out in the streets. In the Norwegian case, what happened was strike, 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 strike over and over. Each year, I charted it in the book, uh, 30 and then 31 more strikes, 32 even more, 33 even more. Um, they, they, what, what they did was made themselves ungovernable by the economic elite. And that would be a key concept strategically. What you do in order to win is you make yourself so disobedient. I know this is hard for middle class people. I know, I know. There's therapy after this. Uh, you make yourself so uh, obstreperous that they can't. Uh, they can't rule anymore because the job of ruling is to actually have people do what you want them to You're not governing a place if people don't do what you say and and that's what they did in uh, It was much more dramatic than that in Sweden because uh, Well, Sweden was ahead of Norway in this whole process and in 1931 they were doing a major strike in a in a town in the south of, North, of Sweden, and the uh, troops were called out. I mean, it was characteristic, you know, you call out the troops because the economic elite, uh, you know, 
doesn't want to give up his privilege. I'm told that Margaret Thatcher had in the back of her mind calling out the uh, troops with, with, with the coal miners if it took that. And uh, because, of, you know, the power of the state, you know, you just do that. And uh, so they did that. Uh, in Sweden in 1931, they did a massacre on unarmed uh, demonstrators. And the country went on general strike. And that was it for the economic elite. Boom, they were done. The government fell, and the new government took over, and uh, and stayed then in power for decades and decades. Um, so, yeah, but not rid of. Be, and so we have to address your second question, which is that the, uh, it's possible for the class struggle to continue, <laughs> right? In other words, there's no reason why the economic elite would not want to regain its former dominance because they know better. That insight came to me through a personal relationship. I'm sweethearts with a millionaire. We fell in love years ago. It's a 25-year-old relationship. And, and he comes from hereditary wealth, right? And and so we talk a lot about these kinds of questions, you know, and I'm blue collar family, small town, obviously very militant blue collar worker. And uh, so so that comes up sometimes in our relationship, but it's also a, que a political question with us. And so at one point he was saying, George, there's something you just don't understand about my people. Tell me, tell me, tell me, Johnny, I said. And he said, look, I was brought up and the all, all my peers, you know, private school, that whole thing, we were brought up believing that we just know better. We just know better. We're brought up to believe that. We don't have to be the smartest person in the room. We will hire the best, the smartest person in the room. Right? We don't have to go to law school, become a lawyer. We will hire the best lawyers. Right? We don't have to be able to be a CEO of a company because we will hire the CEO of the company. So what, what our gift is, what our contribution is, knowing better than other people. So we have the gift of discernment. So we can decide which lawyer to choose or which CEO to choose and when to fire them and so on and so on because we know better. So Johnny says, please, you, you, you know, you talk about, talk about those people as if they're nasty. They're not nasty. They're very nice people. Uh, you're like me, right? And, uh, and, or, or that we, um, uh, what were other, other ways that I was talking about? Uh, or, or that we're greedy or something? We, we, don't, we don't even have to be greedy to make the decisions we make because it's just that we know better. And, and if you happen to know better about something and there are problems to be solved and so on, what's the sense to just turn your knowing better over to somebody who doesn't know as much? Right? It should be the people who know best who run things. So that was very, very helpful to me in understanding that psychology, right? There's no reason why the Swedish economic elite should stop believing that they know better. They still do know better. They've just been pushed out of power, that's all. And as soon as they can get back into power, they will get to run it again. So the class struggle continues and, and always will. So in a democracy, you can afford to do that because in a democracy, you can have a majority of people who don't know better. We're just the people. And then you can have the small number of people who know better, but they're a minority. They're a tiny minority. So don't let them run you because we're the majority and we will look out for the common good while they're looking out for their good, but saying it's because they know better. Is that helpful? Clarify? What, what do we do though when the elite who know better are able to convince enough of those who should not want them in power that they're the best people to run the show. What do we do in that circumstance? That, but that never happens, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's the history of Britain and in my country, right? <laughs> of them uh, using the media, using academia when they can use academia and so on and so on to convince the lesser beings that they in fact know better, right? Okay, so one of the things in the Nordic countries that paid off was the, the, the uh, forming of co-ops. 
Because you had you know, typically oppressed people, let's say farmers, family farmers in Norway, uh, never thinking they could question you know, the elite, right? But noticing that the capitalist-owned dairy down you know, in their area is taking a lot of the profit of their, their hard-earned work with the cows, right? And they get talking and saying, you know what, if we had a dairy, if we had a co-op dairy, then we could keep more of that hard-earned wealth for ourselves, right? Let's do that. So they formed co-op dairies over and over and over. Uh, something like 95% of the dairy industry in Norway is cooperatively owned. So what you had is all these farmers figuring out how they could make economic decisions and just as hard, trusting each other, right, to make smart economic decisions. And a cool thing about a co-op is, if it doesn't make smart decisions, it goes, <laughs> it goes, it, it goes down. So, so there's feedback, right? People can get smarter and smarter. They can learn from each other, and they can grow in that way. So that was a very important feature of uh, of. Uh, of the formation. They were also having study groups all the time in which, um, and Bishop Grundtvig in Denmark made a big contribution to the study process of encouraging people to see through the pretend democracy because there was that, that word out in those days that what the system they had was a democracy. They had a parliament after all. They had elections, free elections, so it must be a democracy, right? Wrong. But they thought so, right? So they needed study groups to be able to, to, be able to notice. Now, is, it is easier now, I think, to, for one thing, we do have some academics on our side. Um, in, in, in the, uh, the BBC has called it the oligarchy study that came out of Princeton a couple of years ago. This shows very clearly that uh, the United States has not been a democracy for many years. Then there's a, a, a rating association that rates different countries by degree of democracy. And we finally have lost our place. We were, up, uh, the U.S. was one of the fully democratic uh, countries, with, and, and we just became a flawed democracy, according to uh, scholars. I'm very pleased, um, because truth will out eventually, right? <laughs> Bad, I, I would suggest the next category might be badly flawed. But anyway, so, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, th I think uh, evidence is piling up that we're, uh, the other way that uh, indicates, indicates that, at least in my country, is that more and more people are just writing off the electoral system, not even bothering to vote. And political scientists will say that when the legitimacy of the, you know, the st stated forms of change and redress of grievance uh, uh, declines, that's when revolutionary struggle becomes available. And that's what happened in the Nordic countries. The legitimacy of their setup 100 years ago declined. People stopped believing in it, started believing in themselves, and then pushed out the economic elite. So it's not hard, right? <laughs> In fact, what makes it even easier for you lot than it was for them is that they had to go to the trouble to invent a good system. And you and we in the States, we don't even have to invent it. It's already invented. I mean, this is why I call my book Viking Economics, because the ancient Vikings were willing to go where no one had gone before. Right, across the Atlantic, just like, shoo, that's amazing. So they were expeditioners willing to go where no one had gone before. Well, that's what they did with regard to inventing the Nordic model. Nobody, no historical society that I've been able to find has ever created an economic model that delivered on equality, on individual freedom, on shared abundance in the way that they, they have done. So they invented it. But goodness gracious, they invented it. Now all we have to do is take it. They won't mind. They didn't copyright it. And in the taking of it, we can make it better. Right? Because that's, the, that's what innovation's about. You take stuff and you keep improving it and tweaking it. So you'll have your own version of it, which will look different from our American version of it. And uh, we'll, we'll all be in the top tier again, which is where we belong because we deserve it. We're wonderful. We know better.
Next question, comment. <laughs> Our government has reduced the amount of prison staff by about 20,000 in the last few years, and the prisons are in a state of chaos, and they're stuffed with people who shouldn't be there, like drug addicts and uh, mentally ill people, and they're full of violence at the moment, and the government doesn't know what to do about it. Now, I've heard that the, the Nordic countries have a much more humane system of prison justice, and uh, <clears throat> they're much closer to real life in prison, and uh, far fewer people in prison. Would you be able to comment on that? Yes, yes. You could also see a wonderful treatment of that in Michael Moore's latest movie, which is called Where, we, Where Should We Invade Next? <laughs> It was obviously a movie made for an American audience because we are always wondering where we're going to invade next. Um, confident that you Brits will join us, of course. But anyway, uh, <laughs> ooh, I couldn't resist that, sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, so he has a slice of that in it, um, and, and it's, it is quite remarkable. They have the lowest recidivism rate in Europe um, because it's, it's centered on the person. And people live in dorms, not in cells. Uh, uh, even in maximum security prisons, the guards don't bother to carry guns. Uh, Michael Moore has this uh, interview with a, a guy uh, who's a chef in the uh, kitchen, in the prison kitchen, and there he's got all these sharp knives and stuff like that. Happens to be a murderer. <laughs> Um, yeah, they, they, they've just moved to a different paradigm for the treatment of offenders. And they're, uh, of course, they have short prison terms and well-staffed, uh, they're well-staffed prisons because they really want to get in there and support the prisoners to be able to make a quick rehab and get back into society. And when, when I ask about it, the answer I get is, well, yes, it's for their own good and it's for the good of their family, but also we want another taxpayer. <laughs> and they're not paying taxes while they're in jail, right? They're only uh, using public money. Well, we'd rather, much rather they get a job. So they do job training. Uh, if they need their hand held to do interviews for a job, they, their hands are held to get interviews for jobs and so on and so on. So it's a whole uh, yeah, concentration of resources in order to get people in and out quickly and into jobs and paying taxes. Because if there's anything Norwegians like to do, it's pay taxes. Like the rest of us, right? I had a funny incident with, uh, when I was having a disagreement with the Internal Revenue Service in my country, um, I, was, uh, on a, I was appealing and appealing and appealing, and I got up to a, a bureaucrat in the tax system who seemed really uh, personable, and I enjoyed talking with him. So I said, look, it's not that I object to paying uh, to, you know, to a, a progressive income tax system. In fact, when I lived in Norway, I paid at a higher rate than here. And he said, well, yeah, but in Norway, you got something for your money. <laughs> that was the tax man said that. The tax man said that. He, even he knew. So who knows what all, you know, these tax people talk to each other. Yeah, very interesting. So, yeah. And they, 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 uh, we, you, you and I were, Jan and I were talking about this. Uh, they understood that the model, the economic model they created would be a high tax model and would give them a tremendous lot. So the basic question for them was, do we want to pay a lot and get a lot? And the answer was, of course. Well, you know, I know people in my country who do that same kind of calculation. Do I want a new car? Uh, do I want, you know, do I want a Mercedes instead of a Chevrolet? Well, I do. <laughs> I'm willing to pay a lot to get a lot. That is not an unknown decision that a consumer makes. You probably all know a consumer who pays more than they really have to to get some particular thing because they're getting more for it, right? That is just plain human nature. We will pay more if we want more to come from it. And, uh, and high tax nations know that, or at least the Nordics know that, so people pay more and they get more. Um, the the uh, Prime Minister of Norway before this one bragged to the New York Times that he won two elections in a row by pledging to his people, I will not lower your taxes. <laughs> 
<laughs> they said, yay, we need you. Yes, be our prime minister. Yay. Because they're not fools. They know you reduce taxes. You also reduce the, the benefits. You reduce the services. You know, you take the hit in education or in prison system or this or that or the other place. If you hit it in prison system, then you get more crime. You get, you know, you get all this mess. Uh, we don't want mess. We want a terrific society. We want a really, really well-working society. And so, of course, we pay for it. We want the best. We deserve the best. Notice that. Notice that. We deserve the best. And I'm sorry, Johnny, but I still resent the impression <laughs> that your people give that because they, quote, know more, that they are our betters and deserve more, and we are their inferiors and deserve less. I resent that. I don't care if you were brought up to believe that or not. I don't like it. I'm as good as you are. Say I to anybody. Yes. Please do. Um, okay, so there's several things that need to be said. One is that definitely when you bring people in from outside, they are not used to your norms, right? So they have to get used to that and learn how to play ball. Not only that, they're not entering on an equal level with the people who already have been there. The people who've been there know the ropes in a way that new people don't. We know that crime is associated with inequality, which is why you have a lot more here than societies that are more equal, and why you're probably getting more. I don't even know that, but in the United States, because inequality is growing, also crime is growing. I should, though, say a couple of things about your comment. One is that um, the, Swed the Swedish police, I double-checked on this statistic lately um, because of this, qu this question coming up. Uh, the Swedish police insist that there's been no increase in violent crime since 2008. There is an increase in crime, but not violent crime. And that's an important distinction. So there, there's more thievery and that kind of thing going on. And uh, I think that that makes sense, that that would be the case. And the government there thinks that it's highly predictable that that would be the case. Um, and that as the integration happens and as the assimilation happens, that that will be, uh, that that will be reduced. Now the calculation that they're they're making two calculations um, on uh, in Sweden that are really important. The Social Democrats are number one. They're making a calculation that the more immigrants they accept, the bigger the pushback they will get from the right, and that's the the point you made. So the more pushback you get from the right, if conceivably, if there's enough residual racism and uh, Islamophobia within Sweden, that, that scenario that you're describing of that becoming the majority could conceivably happen, which would be delightful to the economic elite because then they would have that division that they love to have in a population in order to be able to rule because divide and rule, right, is, is, uh, is an age-old approach. So, eat the, so the, a government like Sweden and Germany and Norway and Denmark each time has to calculate how wide open do we become, uh, how, how much pushback will that generate, because we don't want so much pushback that we lose the, lose the game, right? So that's what they do. They're making uh, the calculated risks. Why, why? There's the human, humanitarian reason as you say, they took, uh, the Swedes took more than the Germans did proportionately um, during that big surge from Syria, and they take that seriously. They take pride. It's a matter of national pride to be welcoming. But there's a second reason, which is a very hard-shelled economic reason. The demographics of Sweden and Norway and, um, and Germany, for that matter, are that they require immigration to be able to keep their economies going in the future. And one reason for that is because Scandinavians like to live forever. <laughs> they ch check, check out those demographics. People live forever. They don't seem to want to die over there. That's partly because it's the best place in the world to be an elder. 
people are very well treated as as uh, senior citizens, and they just like to keep hanging on. But if they're going to keep on living for such a long time, they're going to need younger people to be able to keep the economy going. And of course, that's Merkel's calculation. She knows perfectly well. Germany cannot continue to be the economic powerhouse that it is with an aging population without new people coming in. So these are calculations that are being made, and no reason, I think, for you to fret, because the reason, the, it, in those countries, at least in the Nordic countries, the calculations are being made on a democratic basis. I, for myself, would rather trust the, de the democracy to decide how much, how much uh, immigration, how much this, how much that, rather than the, power of the economic elite. Through free discussion, yes, the uh, anti-immigrant forces can rail about crime and so on all they want. Uh, let's hear that point of view. Let's hear the other points of view and let's make a democratic decision. And that's what the Nordics are doing. They're making democratic decisions about how much they want to put up with the downside of immigration in order to get the very, very prized upside of immigration. And that's the calculation they're making. Maybe in your society you would make a different calculation, but I don't think so <laughs> because uh, you've already been through a, a lot of what Sweden is more recently going through. By the way, uh, Sweden uh, and Norway both have one in five now of the population foreign born, which is more, last I checked, than Britain has. So that, 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 that our image of the good old days when, if, if that's good old days, when practically everybody was ethnic Swedish or ethnic Norwegian, um, that's just not true anymore. The, they're increasingly heterogeneous uh, populations and um, on basis of performance they're doing extremely well with it. And at the same time, they're as mindful as you are of what, what they're base, basing policy decisions on, which is A, calculating uh, outcomes and B, the democratic will of the people. And that's why my visit to the Anti-Racism Center was so important when I was told that um, the majorities in those countries are solidly behind uh, as much immigration as they've been doing. Finally, just another footnote, uh, the Swedes are also correcting a, a, particular, a Swedish policy of placement of immigrants and they're adopting the Norwegian way of placing immigrants. And my book explains what the Norwegian way is. It's different from the Swedish way. And, uh, it, and the reason they're doing it is exactly because of the point you made, that when you have lots of people in, a, an, in an area who talk the same language and therefore are, are more able to get away with not, not learning Swedish, and you know, the multiple, multiple impact of getting a kind of ghettoization that happens, then you also have other things like gangs that were existing in that world before, uh, you know, gang, gang behavior showing up again in the new society. Uh, Norway has a whole lot less of that, and the reason is because they have a very different pattern of settlement for immigrants, and now Sweden has decided to adapt that. Which is my final point, and you're very eager. Uh, I am too, because I want to I have uh, conversations. Uh, but uh, the final point, which is, that one way that we can, each, each society, you, the Americans, and the Nordics among themselves, what, one of the things we can do is watch each other's practice, that's what you were inviting with regard to crimin, uh, criminal justice, watch each other work at these hard questions, and then adopt best practices. And that's what I love about this Swedish change of immigration policy. They've watched the Norwegians now for years doing something that works better, and now they're adopting it. And wouldn't it be wonderful if my society, anyway, would take the same approach? It's not unusual in the professions. It's called best practices, right? When you're, when you tackle, when you're in, into a problem, you look around. Who's doing this? Who's being successful with this problem? I want to copy from what's working best. And that's one reason why I spent the years and years researching and writing the book, because I wanted us to be available, have available easily and conveniently the best practices that now exist. Thanks very much.